Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Fireside Chat Extraordinaire. I'm Susan Scott Parker. I'm with Business Inter uh, Disability International, and I'm a strategic advisor to the ILO's Global Business and Disability Network. And I've spent a long time looking at why it's so hard for the well-intentioned employer to recruit people with disabilities routinely, while it's so hard for the person with a disability who's looking for a job to find that employer and make that connection. And so today our theme is very much focused on why disability projects are not enough. Why just dropping a, a, a little project in for two or three years, telling it, go ahead and help disabled people into work, isn't having the kind of impact that we need. And there's no doubt the data shows there's been no substantial increase in the success rates of the programs that are funded to help people prepare and look for work over the last 20 years. So I guess our theme for today is very much everyone needs to do things differently, not just the employer, but including the employer. So I'm really pleased that we've got some, the opportunity today to learn from the experience of my ability and la culiem, I hope finally I'm getting my head around that Latin American expression, and to look in some detail at what it means to shape job markets rather than drop job boards into the middle of a job market and wonder why it's not having the impact that anybody would hope for. So I'm going to start by asking my guests to introduce themselves. So I'm starting with Wolfgang. Wolfgang, who are you? What's my ability? And what gives you the right to talk about this? What have you guys been doing over the last 10 years? Thank you for the invitation. Very happy to be here. My name is uh, Wolfgang Kovac. I'm co-founder of uh, MyAbility, and MyAbility um, wants to support organizations, employers, to become disability confident, and we do it, we do it in, in different ways. The story goes back to, to a personal uh, happening. I was managing director of an online job board, um, which was a mainstream one, when I got a phone call of a client, and uh, this client was called Gregor, and he said, Wolfgang, thank you so much. We hired a person with a disability over your platform. And I was kind of surprised, first, that someone calls to say thank you, and second, <laughs> that we had uh, a great conversation afterwards. And uh, some months later, we launched a job board for people with disabilities. And uh, as Susan said in her statement at the beginning, some years later, we found out that it's not enough. So uh, from a publicly funded job board, which was great to start, I need to say, the, the, the support, um, we made something bigger out of it because we saw that there are many more relevant aspects in order to make this, these processes more efficient and, and work. Uh, and uh, we funded or founded MyAbility in 2014, so it's almost 10 years, not, not um, as Gabriel. I think you will have the birthday this year. Um, and uh, what we, we do is, um, next to running a quite successful job board, by the way, in, in Austria, Germany and Switzerland, we also implemented um, additional services um, for the companies because we think it's very important to get companies on board, first, that they commit, second, that they use the tools that work, and third, that it keeps working. You know, that's the last part is especially important. As you said, if it's only a one or two years initiative, then uh, very often so things don't work uh, out uh, properly and then the thing is, uh, is, is over. So. Um, to explain it in, in other words, we have four pillars. The first one is, as I said, a job board and the recruiting support. We also run a talent program where we connect. What's the, what's the scale of the job board? You were telling me how many candidates are approaching like it. At the, at the moment, we, we have more than 5,000 job offerings online from many different companies in the German-speaking area. And uh, we have more than 20,000 unique users most of them with disabilities on our site every month. So it's quite a volume. So why and wasn't that good enough? Sounds pretty good. Because um, it's not only about uh, sourcing. It's not only about getting more registrations as a company. It starts much earlier. It starts with, are we ready? It starts with, how can we communicate our options and our brand to certain target groups? Do we do this in an accessible way? What happens when there is job interviews? How can we select the best one? How do we recruit without discrimi discriminating? How do we onboard properly? How do we make teams work that are diverse? How do we maintain motivation and efficiency with, uh, with the diverse teams? 
how do we develop talent? So just a very quick <laughs> in, intuitive answer. The value chain is much longer and the job board is, I think, a, a, a very important part of it. And it's a lot of passion from my side going into that, but it's only part. And, and um, just to finish my <laughs> explication from, from before, next to that we do consultancy, mainly in recruiting, but also in strategy and other areas, and accessibility. Then we have a lot of trainings and, and um, um, decision maker awareness initiatives going on, online, offline, e-learning, all these things. And the fourth and last pillar is the network. We talked about it before. We also try to connect our contacts, our clients, our network with each other so that they learn from each other, that there's peer learning, that uh, they do not need to, to run the empty mile um, and we help to, to be efficient there. So that's a bit the story. At the moment we have 40 employees, half of them with a disability, so we have been growing quite, quite strongly the last few years, but it's hard work, it's a lot of passion, it's a lot of dedication, but it, it pays off. Well, having watched you for years, I'm struck by how the phrase social enterprise, you work really hard on both fronts. That if this is adding value to a business, they should jolly well pay, like they would pay for any other contribution to their business success, but a strong social focus. May I add something to that? Because of it's course. a very important question. I think one of our key factors is that we are a company ourselves. Like, we do not do anything else. We do need income, we do need to create value, we do, we do need to hit the quality expectations of our customers. And only like that we can understand how companies work, how organizations work, how processes go, and how can they be um, um, improved. And this kind of logic behind that is very important. But at the same time, and this is the social part, we do everything and our passion goes where more accessibility, more fairness, more, more, um, yeah, more dis disabled people go into the market, uh, labor market goes. That's, that's the, the other part of it. Well, it's been very interesting seeing how you start in Austria, but it's clear that you're going to be bringing employers together across the German-speaking region to have a completely new approach to this, which is great. Tell us about your empire in Latin America. How many countries do you operate in? Tell we us about your organization. In 11 countries. How many? 11 so far. So please tell our audience what it's all about. Uh, Incluime.com is an organization that works for social and labor inclusion of people with disabilities across Latin America. And the reason why, why we are doing that is because we are working in a region where three out of four people with disabilities are unemployed. Three out of four unemployed. Three out of four. So it's one of the highest unemployed regions for people with disabilities in the world. And um, I'm very close about the difficulties that a person with disability have once uh, the person is losing a job and this person is unable to provide either for themselves or their families. So back in 2013, uh, this year where we are celebrating our 10th year's uh, birthday, we start digging about uh, what was causing those problems and we found out that every time a person with a disability arrived to, inter to, an interview, to an interview, they were getting off because of their disability. I mean, the, the interviewer was afraid about how to mm -hmm. ask about what the person can do and what cannot, and also afraid to ask about, okay, do you have a disability? Do you need any reasonable accommodation? So in a nutshell, the resume was taking the person to the interview, but the disability was rejecting the person to the job. And we start working also with companies we, uh, trying to, underst to understand what they were doing regarding accessing to the talent of people with disabilities in the region. And one of the key learnings were that, okay, the people, sorry, companies were having diversity and inclusion programs, but they were not able to reach the talent of people with disabilities. So in one hand, we were having a lot of unemployed people trying to uh, get a job, and on the other hand, we were having companies willing to hire, but they were not connected with each other. So we did the obvious. I mean, I come with that technological background, so we say, okay, let's connect them uh, using uh, an online platform. We start working with uh, local NGOs back in Argentina and say, hey, you're invited to, to be part of this initiative. And they were say, okay, I, I'd love to do that, but I have all the resumes in paper. You've so, got the resumes in paper. Yep. Yeah. So when we start looking for databases, they say, okay, that's it, that's my database. So we start uh, digitalizing all these resumes and try to make uh, people visible and actionable for NGOs as well to say, hey, 
and to have people here. Um, nowadays, we manage to, to scale up the, the company, not only to be a, a job board for people with disabilities, but also to, uh, as uh, Wolf mentioned before, I mean, to try to understand and to deliver more services to companies to make inclusion happen. And that for us, it means to start working with uh, a diagnosis of the company to understand where the company is and to work based on data, not on perceptions, uh, which is huge in, in several cases because companies sometimes they say, okay, I do think I'm like this, but in the reality data is showing up that, okay, you already have employees with disabilities. You never ask how this, this, those employees are and if they are having any particular needs. You never ask about how your recruiting process is and if you are excluding by design applicants with disabilities. And once you're having all this data in place, then you can deliver trainings and to, then you're ready to start hiring employees with disabilities. But we need to work on the culture first, uh, trying to have an inclusive culture. And after that, it doesn't matter where, the, uh, where an applicant is, is rich in the company, it can be using any traditional job board, LinkedIn, or us. But the goal is to have the company ready to understand the talent beyond the disability. And so far, that's where we're working. Often the employers will say that they can't find suitable candidates because the candidates that the NGOs or the not-for-profits give them don't have the skills they're looking for. Haven't you also gone upstream, if you like, in terms of talent and started to equip people with the skills they need so that the employers can hire them over here? Can you tell us a bit about what you're doing? Sure, uh, and that's absolutely true. I mean, when you understand what's the situation about people with disabilities in the region, you find out that having a disability is a ticket for unemployment, and it's also very hard for the person to have the right skills that companies are looking for. And one example of that are tech skills, where if you are a software developer and you, if you are able to speak English, you are having higher chances to have a job rather than if you are not having those skills. Unfortunately, our ecosystem is, uh, I would say, excluding people because transportation is not accessible, uh, educational schools are not accessible, and also online classes are not accessible for several people. So what we did was to start uh, to run a pilot back in 2020 with 40 people with disabilities and train it as software developers. And the employability rate was plus 80%. So we said, hey, if you give the right skills to people desperately in need to acquire those skills and, and you help these people also to prepare a good resume and, and to prepare also these people with um, the skills needed for, um, uh, to have a good interview, then this connection happens. And it's not about uh, only to say, okay, we need to train, it's also we need to support a person who has been out of the market for a long time. So you need to say, okay, you need to be prepared for uh, four people having an interview in you and how to respond to different questions coming from different angles. So after that, after this year, uh, we managed to train 3,000 people with disabilities in tech and we keep going and we keep training. Are you still getting that 80% into jobs result? Well, we are training a lot so far. So this, uh, managed, this rate is decreasing because we are still training people now We're and until they, they are uh, finished their trainings, it's going to take time for the employment, but we hope to, to have this rate as well. I asked about the rate because all too often the system has projects which train disabled people, but they're measured by how many they trained. They don't even track how many actually got jobs because they argue, well, we're not funded to do the tracking or because as far as they're concerned, it, it's the training that matters where actually all of us are saying it's the jobs, the economic empowerment that matters at the end. I mean, I'm struck listening to you. Um, thinking of the work that GIZ is doing in partnership with the ILO's Global Business Disability Network, we called it Digital in Demand. And it's a reaction to an approach to helping disabled people get work, which is so fragmented, where you drop in little projects, little training things, and you, you don't actually look at the job market dynamics, the job market problems that have been caused. So one of those problems is low expectations. We see funders funding training programs that will get 
20, 30 percent of their people into work. That's a 70 to 80 percent failure rate as far as I'm concerned. I have what I call the sister test. Would you send your sister to a program that has a 30 percent success rate? Most people will sort of shrug and say no. But we've just recently seen a, a UK government program where they announced they were putting more than seven million pounds into an initiative to get people with autism into work on a project basis. And the press release predicts a 70% failure rate. And so what I like about the work that you all do is you have these high expectations that if you support the employer so that the four people doing the interview you just described understand the implications if this candidate is lip reading or has a stammer, you support the job seekers to get the skills if necessary, but support them with, say, the, the soft skills. Um, we've, we've developed a partnership with Accenture on their soft skills program called Skills to Succeed. If there's anyone watching this who helps people to prepare for work and you're not using the Accenture Skills to Succeed program, you're wasting time. Why reinvent a soft skills program when the, the guys with the know-how have already done it? And Sight Savers will tell you, hundreds of people with disabilities around the world are using that program now and they're moving straight into jobs because somehow it's just fitting, fitting a need. But coming back to digital in demand, we're looking at a process that would bring a group of companies together in a talent compact, we're calling it. They have a shared skill shortage and they would reach out to their local training providers and say, we usually go to you, say a Cisco Academy, for cybersecurity skills. Why don't you bring more disabled people in so that we can access disabled candidates with your certification in cybersecurity? And so GIZ has been funding um, the pioneering academies in Nairobi and now in South Africa, where while it is a specialist program for disabled people, it's geared to address job market failures like those low expectations like it costs too much, and since disabled people are more likely to be the poorest, they are excluded from even inaccessible online training programs because they can't afford them. And they're now getting more than 90% of the disabled students that come through these academies into paid internships and jobs, 90%. So I just want to say what we're talking about is the need to, for the funders in particular to require people when they get a, f a project off the ground, when they get funded, to prove they're also meeting the needs of business, as well as supporting the candidates, as well as supporting the training providers. There's a role for a coordinating function that says it's not about the problem isn't the employer, the problem is the job market is failing both the employer and the disabled job seeker. Now I know Wolfgang, you've been thinking about this. Can you see a shift, perhaps, in the way that employers that you're working with are looking at this. I know PwC were finding this to be increasingly important to them. Absolutely. There's a huge shift um, that has been going on. Uh, it's just not easy to describe it with, with some words. But um, I sometimes I use the example when we, when we started talking about what we are doing eight years ago, we need to spell inclusion. No one knew about it. No one understood it. Now, when you, when you start talking about these kind of things, it can be inclusion, it can be disability confidence or whatsoever, companies listen. In many occasions, they also have someone in place, especially with bigger organizations, that takes care about DEI or disability or accessibility. So from that point of view, it's much easier to communicate what, what we think is, needs to be done. This is a big shift. This is the first Excellent. one. Excellent. Uh, and, and the second shift, when we talk a bit more about labor markets, um, the second dynamics or shift is also the desperate need for talent that is going on now. It's nothing new. We don't need to discuss this very long. But it's very obvious that in many regions in the world, I think also in, in Latin America, there's lack of tech guys, there's lack of uh, specialists for many, many things. And um, also because of that, companies start thinking, what else can we do? It's not only about migration, it's not only about age, it's not only about qualification, it's also about target groups. Um, in our case, uh, people with disabilities. So this helps a lot as well. Um, but the third part maybe is to, to talk about the efficiency of the labor market as such. And then here I also see that um, not only the companies have a bit of changed um, um, attitude or, or understanding of the situation, but also um, 
the candidates and, 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 the, and the public. So there's more awareness now that it's not only the right of people to have a job and we need to bring someone, it doesn't matter what this person do. This was the thinking maybe also 10 years ago, I have someone, do we have a, a place for him or her? We heard that many, uh, many times, now much less. So there is a raising awareness of on both sides, I think. But what is still missing a lot, and it's my favorite wording these days, it's about social innovation. I think that, that organizations such as Gabriel's and ours and many others were working very hard on different aspects and mainly also focusing on, on a value proposition for employers and maybe also training providers to make this work better. And if, if the public or other, other stakeholders understand that there is great ideas out there that, they c that could be used and could be maybe developed further together in partnerships, I think we would get there much faster. And we would get from, from a situation where there's many, many isolated short-term projects going on everywhere in every country to a big thinking. Where do we want to go? Who are the most efficient and creative guys who can help us? How can we do this together? And this is really something that needs to be done still. And here the shift has not happened. Not yet, but you're behind it. We are behind it. You're behind it. Did you want to add to that, Gabriel? Um, I fully agree with Wolfgang. I mean, one of the things that and during this journey we learn is that it's far easier to make inclusion happen today than it was 10 years ago, but still a lot of things need to, to be done. And one thing, uh, to, to your point on, okay, we do have people now in companies working on, okay, I'm in charge of make this happen. But sometimes in, in my region, p people are just having good intentions and no money to do that. So we are having companies with more than 100,000 employees where the people responsible of making inclusion happens is one person strong yeah. with no funding. So That's why I want to talk to the chief technology officer. <laughs> So we need to help this person who has the intentions and the willingness to make this happen, to say, okay, this is making sense on a market perspective and a business side perspective. And the goal is to say, okay, if I invest money on in that, what I'm getting? And the yeah. ROI of the investment of saying, hey, is it a payoff to do that or not? Right. And we need to shift from the vision of saying, okay, this is a charity approach where, okay, I'm doing good, good stuff and just giving money to uh, vulnerable populations to say, okay, this is part of my business to be part of the society and I can have a benefit right. of talent and also of a better serving solutions to my community. And for me, it links to the message that they're driving business improvement which also benefits people with disabilities. Because if you learn how to recruit everyone on the basis of what they can do, not get distracted by stuff that's irrelevant, like being a cranky Canadian woman, um, you're a better recruiter of everyone. And if you give everyone the tools they need, including your disabled colleagues, you're enhancing productivity across the piece, business improvement. But I wanted to come in quickly on, on the shift because we are seeing as companies look at job markets and say, why is it so hard for us to attract talent? They're starting to invest in terms of the ESG or the CSR agenda in new ways. So HSBC, working with Cisco, is sponsoring an e-learning package that would help a sales force, digital trainer, Cisco, whatever company you're looking at, to also teach people with disabilities. So we move away from the segregated programs that are divorced from business reality. They're not connecting to the talent pipelines. And you'll see that the self-assessment tool, the benchmark that the ILO's Global Business Disability Network just launched in December, free on their website, 47 questions. There's a bunch of questions moving from are you treating people properly, the equality stuff and the culture stuff and the customer stuff, there's about allyship and how companies can be encouraged now to invest in their job markets in ways which make it easier for people to get the skills so that all the employers on that patch can access disabled talent more readily. I'm very encouraged by it. And by Cisco, for example, the Cisco Academy program, publicly saying that disability now is going to be a real priority because they see this as extending the reach and the return on investment they're already making in their thousands of academies around the world with more than 3.1 million people learning now the skills they're going to need in order to fill those in-demand vacancies. 
So I'm encouraged, um, and I think we're seeing in the developing countries uh, interesting examples of corporate citizenship where everybody's winning. Did you see that Pizza Hut in Sri Lanka recruited and employed people with disabilities, discovered actually it made perfect sense, and are now investing in a partnership with a foundation and the government to create a, a they're building from scratch a, a training center that will teach people with disabilities the skills they need to work in the fast food industry across Sri Lanka. So that's a really good example of Pizza Hut wins because they have a steady stream of people coming to them that add value to the business, but so does the local economy and the local job market. So for me, the, the point of this whole session was projects are not enough. So I'm hoping some funders are watching. You're going to attract applicants who want your money so that they can help disabled people into work, and you're going to say, how are you supporting employers? How are you supporting the mainstream training providers? What are you learning from what the social entrepreneurs are doing now that's innovative in this space, like training thousands of people so that they can come onto your job board instead of just putting in a job board? And what you're hearing is my personal frustration. I am fed up with job boards being the solution. They just are not. So if you're tempted to fund a job board and then let it sit there, please don't do it. Call Wolfgang, call Gabrielle, talk it through, and find a more systematic way of addressing the fact that we've got a mismatch in these job markets between the supply of the talent with the skills employers are looking for and the ability of the employers to attract that talent, get that demand function absolutely at the heart of it. So that's what I wanted to do. Is there anything else that you wanted to add in terms of why you were joining me today on this, on this uh, fireside chat? I've had my rant. Have you got a rant that you'd like to add? Just uh, um, to, to your point, I mean, inclusion of people with disabilities in the workplace is only the first step. I mean, once the company is getting inclusion happens uh, inside the company, then is where we start delivering change to the society. I mean, we're having companies that we start working with those companies a few years ago where they have no idea at all about what a disability means. And nowadays those companies are saying, hey, how can I make services and products accessible for my customers with disabilities? And then one example of Uber in Argentina, they start from knowing nothing to have nowadays more than a thousand Uber drivers with disabilities having an income and also trying to understand the experience of passengers with disabilities and to improve those, these experiences. Brilliant. So this is the shift that we want to see in several companies and this is how an inclusive ecosystem is being created. And this is a global audience, so I want you all to knock on Uber's door in your neighborhood and ask them why they're not doing exactly the same thing. Wolfgang, your final Just words. My final words, also referring a bit to what you said, Susan, I think we also need to to move from case management to culture, confidence, competence, and all this. And this can only be done with this integrated approach that we've been discussing. It's not only about sol solving a problem and then jumping to the next, but, but see it in a whole. And, and this, the last, second and last thought is, um, let's also use this, this um, trend towards how to measure social impact, how to, how to onboard big companies to score in their ESG ratings. And here we should not only forget that it's also about governance. It's not only about social, but also governance. It should be put high on, on the agenda in, within the companies that it's relevant for the future. And if we manage to, to link this in, the, um, in a better way, then everything will, will profit. Excellent. Thank you very much. And thank you to the wonderful Zero Project for letting us rant 